up until a few years ago, my community where I live, like in Burlington, Ontario, you know, in Southern Ontario and Canada, had been pretty resilient, or what I thought was pretty resilient when it came to climate change consequences. We hadn't really had many huge storms. We hadn't really had, uh, you know, droughts or anything like that. We were pretty resilient. And up until a couple of years ago, I even said that. I was like, you know, I'm surprised. I'm like, we live in a pretty good place. You know, when you look at what's going on in the world, weather-wise and, you know, consequence-wise from climate change, we didn't have many floods, you know, although we did have some, but we didn't have many floods, not on an annual basis. We didn't have um, droughts or forest fires or things like that. A lot of other people were in much worse condition than we are. And, and to be honest, even today, you know, a lot of people feel the effects way more. So when I look, when I still look at things and, you know, knock on wood, we're pretty, we're pretty decent in terms of what happens with climate change. However, uh, the last two years, we've really noticed some, um, uh, some vulnerabilities within, uh, you know, within our own community resiliency uh, when it came to climate change. And I'm going to talk about what those things are, especially when it comes to rain uh, in the last year and forest fires the year before. So we're going to talk about why I think community Climate change resiliency equals community resiliency. And we're going to talk about that on today's episode of the How to Protect the Ocean podcast. Let's start the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another exciting episode of the How to Protect the Ocean podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Lewin. And this is the podcast where you find out what's happening with the ocean, how you could speak up for the ocean, what you can do to live for a better ocean by taking action. And today I wanted to talk about a little thing called a lot of rain and and just sort of vulnerability to climate change because my community my city was caught in some vulnerabilities you know I, I find you know climate change consequences rain drought um, floods all those things that happen more and more with climate change are really really highlight the vulnerabilities in our community within our infrastructure within things like that and and I find that this past couple of weeks my community, Burlington, as the city of Burlington and, and Ontario, and even the region of Halton, really came into some cold, like flooding mess, right? And and we had a lot of rain. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about today what this does for a community, how it affects a community, and you know where we need to go from there. But but first, I just want to quick quick thing I want to do. If you want to find out more news, if you're new to this podcast, you've, you've first found it. I have a newsletter where I send out Monday to Friday, I send out news on what's happening in the ocean, what's happening in various communities around the world so that you get to know more about what you can do to live for a better ocean or inspired to live for a better ocean. And so you get that in your inbox. It's really easy to say. It's free to sign up, really easy to do. Just go to speakupforblue.com forward slash newsletter and you can sign up for that newsletter. So that's speakupforblue.com forward slash newsletter and you can sign up for free. I don't do anything with your email other than send you an email Monday to Fridays with my newsletter. We also have jobs there too if you're looking for jobs. But let's get back to the show. Because I feel like this is something that I've been wanting to talk about for a while because climate change sucks, dude. Like, it sucks. You know, it, to be able to see communities on TV suffer is one thing. It, it's awful, you know, and people have, you know, many people have lost their lives. They lost their, lost their livelihoods, lost their homes. Um, we live in a fairly good city. You know, we're always in the top five cities to live in in, in Canada. I mean, we have our problems, but... For the most part, we're pretty safe. It's a, it's a it's a nice city. It's a great people. Uh, it's friendly. It's small. You know, traffic's getting bad, but whatever. You know, overall, we're doing pretty well. I'm pretty happy with the city that I chose to raise my family. My my wife and I chose to raise our family. But over the past couple of years, we've really seen some. I would almost say minor in terms of what climate change can do, but we've seen some effects, and, and it's hurt more people. It's hurt some people more than others. And, uh, you know, we need to talk about it because it really starts to talk to our resiliency as a community, as a city, when it comes down to climate change. And if we can, if we want to build climate change resiliency, we have to start noticing our vulnerabilities and be able to change what our city is going to be like in the future and how we plan for the future. So this is, it's, it's going to be an interesting talk. It's going to be a lot of local stuff. So I apologize if you're not in the area. Uh, but it's something that I've wanted to talk about for a little bit. And, you know, up until recently, we've never really had to talk about it because we've never really felt the effects that much within the city. We had a flooding about 10 years ago. Um, and this, these one in 10 year storms, one in 100 year storms, but they're happening more frequently. 
And with the hurricane season, you know, coming in a little early with Hurricane Barrel, the last couple of weeks have been really interesting. Uh, starting off with Hurricane Barrel, as many people know, Hurricane Category 5, uh, coming through the Caribbean, ripping through islands, destroying islands, and then coming into the U.S. through Houston and then up through North America, uh, up through the U.S. and really into into Canada, in, into Ontario. And we got a really big dump of rain. Not the huge high winds that you saw from a hurricane. It was down to, I think it was less than a tropical storm. It was just a regular, I think it was squalls, I think it was, it was called. We, we haven't had squall warnings in a long time. We rarely get them. And so when we had the hurricane barrel come through, we had a lot of water in very little time. And we started to see some accumulation of water. My backyard flooded a little bit, as it always does with heavy rains. But then it goes away, you know, the next day or within it, within it a couple of days. We started to see roads get a little flooded. People were saying, just watch out. There's certain areas where you go underneath a bridge and the, the, the street goes down. That was filled with water for a while. It was just inaccessible for, like I said, maybe a few, a few hours, maybe half a day. It wasn't as bad, and it's kind of like what we come to expect. Now, you'd think we had this 10 years ago. You'd think that, you know, the city or the region would, or the, even the province would think about fixing these types of things. It doesn't seem like it was fixed. I don't have any reports saying that they were trying to fix it or they were doing anything about it, but I have a feeling our our city, the way it's, the planning goes for a lot of things, from what I understand, and I could be wrong on a lot of these things, but we plan, you know, with water, we plan on specific storms. So one in every 10-year storm, one in every 50-year storm, one in every 100-year storm. We're just getting them more often, it seems. And it is starting to expose what we have. So we had a hurricane barrel come through a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it, obviously not as bad as what other people had, but like I said, we, we had some vulnerabilities exposed. Then the rain just kept coming. It would be announced, it'd be a beautiful day, and then you'd look at your, your weather app, whatever weather app you had, and then all of a sudden it's like squall warning. And there'd be this huge, huge storm that would come out of nowhere, lasting for 15, 20 minutes, at half an hour, sometimes an hour. And then it would go away, and it would open, the skies would just kind of like open up into sunny skies, the clouds would go away, blue skies, and then an hour later, we'd get rain again. And then like two hours later, we'd get rain again, and it would continue to happen. It was almost like very... You know, a lot of people were making the, the observation that it was very, like, Florida-type weather. You know, it gets so, so hot, and then the rain comes, and then hot again, and then the rain comes, and then it kind of eventually cools off. Never really did cool off, but we kept getting rain, and, like, heavy rains in a very small period of time. And so we started to see that accumulation of water, an accumulation of water, until some, some neighborhoods in my area had so much water that, you know, fridges were floating in their basement, you know, uh, they had to evacuate their homes. There were some areas, one area in particular, where I saw pictures where the water was above the fence line, like a six-foot fence line. It was obviously dangerous. Nobody got hurt, thank God, that I, that I know of. Um, but, you know, people are affected. I've heard, you know, anecdotal stories of insurance companies not being able, not covering the, the damages because it's a, you know, quote-unquote act of God or, or natural disaster. And so they don't, they don't cover that, which is interesting you, know, you pay all that insurance, and then you know there's always the fine print. But that's devastating. When your home is destroyed, all your personal items are destroyed. We're not used to this. We don't expect it. And I think there is some sort of uh, assumption that the city is going to protect us, the region and the province is going to protect us from these things. We have engineers. We have a lot of great people. We have planners who do a lot of great work. They work their butt off. They can only work within the legislation, of course, but then there's all these, these vulnerabilities to these 100-year storms, the 50-year storms. And we plan those because, hey, you know what? They only happen every once in a while. And we could probably, we could probably handle those every once in a while. You know, I feel you know, safe here in terms of you know, when flooding happens and stuff. I, I, I feel like we're okay. We get a little water in our basement. Nothing, nothing to, you know, there's, some people are, are out of pocket more than others. But for the most part, I think most of us before this felt safe. After this, when you see all the damages to homes, you see it, like cars being like in parking lots, like open parking lots where flooding is coming in and we're just seeing damages to cars and cars like you can't even see them. You see the top of their roofs. It's it's it wakes you up as a city, you know, to say, hey, you know what? We're not we're not immune to climate change. 
You know, we thought we were. We're not immune. Last year, we had a little bit of a taste of it, literally a little bit of a taste of it, with the smoke that was coming down from the forest fires up north in northern Ontario and northern Quebec, and we got the smoke. You know, worse, you know we didn't get the fires, you know, that, uh, you know, thank, thank the Lord we didn't, but we, f- we, felt, we felt the smoke. You know, our air quality went down. We started to wear masks again, not because of COVID. We started wearing masks again, some people, just because of the, the air. People with asthma had to be careful. You know, we started to see those vulnerabilities in our society, and we had to be more careful of what we do because of the smoke inhalation. It's not good for you. We don't want to see this. And so, you know, you have... Yes, last year, you have this year, what's happened so far this year, uh, there's there's something that tells me we're just we're just starting this, especially if we're starting to get more hurricane weather that comes up. I think Ontario has only had one hurricane. I think it was in the 1950s, and it it devastated us because we're, obviously we're not built for hurricanes or, or, or storms. We get tornadoes in certain parts of Ontario, but not not where I live. It's very rare that we get them. But the thing is, is is climate change is bringing this type of weather, and it's erratic. We don't know when it's going to happen, and we don't know how it's going to happen. But people are still fighting it, you know, politically. And, and I'll, that'll be for next episode. I want to talk more about that in the terms of the communication. But it, my, my concern is for the people who are in vulnerable spots in their homes where there's, they were prone to flooding here, like in, this, in the last couple of weeks, how do they go forward? You know, they could fix their house up again, but for, to what avail? Do they have to make certain adaptations to be able to, you know, stop the water from coming into their place? Do they have to make, you know, a, a large investment in their home to ensure that there's enough drainage around them to not only get rid of the water, but not flood the area? How is the city going to help? Uh, we have a, a an organization called Conservation Halden, which is a great organization. I'm trying to get an interview with them uh, about this soon, um, just to be able to talk about it. Because, you know, when it comes to to cities, it, 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 we you know we have to make sure that we are resilient. I've had interviews just the other day. I had an interview with uh, Rocky from Rare, who's in the Philippines, talking about how Rare and other partners are working with fishing communities to make sure that they're resilient. Not only can they continue to fish after big storms but how do they get back up and running if they can't fish right away like their marine protected areas have to be protected and they have to be sort of filled back up again and allowed to recoup after a storm they may not be able to fish again well they have a savings account a community savings account where they put money in and they put that together i guess for us that's taxes like here in canada like we'd have to have like we'd have to rely on our city to make the right infrastructure plans and to make sure that we're adaptable and we're resilient to these types of storms in the future. From what I gather, you know, on some of the comments on social media within the city is, do we feel confident that our politicians can do that? I feel right now that there's some problems there because we weren't resilient according to what we, I've seen. And, you know, this is anecdotal. We, are, we, have, we aren't resilient now. So how are we going to be resilient in the future? I feel like this is a bit of a wake-up call. You know, when you look at climate resiliency, you look at community resiliency. This is something that we have to ensure we are resilient to these types of storms. We're going to see these types of storms more often. I know we're in an El Nino year. It's the last year. There's going to be an El Nino year next year. How does that work? I, I don't really know off the bat. I have to do some research on that. But there's obviously things are going to change. El Nino is going to come back at some point quicker and maybe even worse than before we're seeing record high ocean temperatures which is affecting hurricane season we don't know what hurricane season is going to be like it's already started apparently normally they say oh after june 30th to november 30th or november or october 30th is the hurricane season but we never see a category five in july or at the end of june that's that's sort of new to us it hasn't happened in a long time and it seems like it's going to happen more often now. That's worrisome for Caribbean nations and, and people in the Gulf of Mexico, in, in the Caribbean Sea, you know, Central America, you know, southern U- U.S. But it's also now we have to worry about here in Ontario because that water's coming. That, that system is, it could come right up, uh, you know, right up the U.S. and right up to central Ontario. So this makes it, you know, this makes a, it's a wake up call. And I think it's a wake up call to us a little bit uh, late for us here in in Southern Ontario, uh, from what I, from my gather. Um, 
but we are also seeing changes locally that worry me. You know, we're starting to see in Ontario more development, more uh, pressure being put on development, and people need more housing. People, so when you know, where do politicians go when they need more housing? They need to build more houses. So where do they go? They go to green spaces. You know, there's there in in the province of Ontario, just north of Toronto, there's the green belt. It's a green belt that's protected on purpose. Same with the escarpment. It's a huge, you know, uh, I guess feature. It, those are both huge features in Ontario that we've decided to protect as a people, and we love so much and we've protected them pretty well so far but it seems like more pressure to build homes seems like there's going to alleviate some of those protections and put homes in there there's a big scandal that's been going on for the last couple of years with the ontario government and a little bit of like let's you scratch my back i scratch yours you help me get elected i'll help you provide uh provide some space for you to make billions of dollars on homes that allegedly happened and 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 there's no recourse it seems like there's no consequence uh, for politicians who do that. And we're starting to see that, you know, we've seen that for years. We're starting to see that more and more. And, you know, you look at some of the flooding that happened in Toronto and you look at the lack of, you know, green belt in the first place. There's a reason why we protected it. And you're, you're starting to see like, hey, some of these green spaces are there not only just for beauty and the fact that we love nature, but it's the fact that it helps our, you know, make ourselves resilient against these big storms. It helps handle and, and even though there might be some flooding, it, it minimizes that flooding. But it seems like, you know, the money and the greed outweigh the protections. And, and unless we have organizations and communities that, that step up to our leaders and say, hey, you know what, like, what are we going to do going forward? Like, we're in the situation now. You know, we're developing, like, City of Burlington is, a play, is designated as a place to grow in Ontario. We're going to grow, and we're, we're growing. We're putting up, you know, condos left, right, and center. Um, you know, we're not expanding our infrastructure in terms of roads. There's lots of traffic now. Um, you know, we have, we have huge problems. If we, we have a bridge that's close by, if that bridge goes out because of, of, you know, an accident or high winds, the city shuts down essentially, especially at rush hour. So there's a lot of problems that we have locally and we need to help solve those so that when these big storms or these consequences from climate change come up, we're more resilient to them. And that's a, that's a thing for planners and for engineers and for politicians and for the community itself to get involved and know more. I'm not saying that the work isn't going on. We have, like, the city, you know, we have some great people, I feel, like, in, our, in, our, uh, in our city offices, and I feel like there's a lot of people who are doing some great work out there and trying their best, but they work within the legislation. And sometimes the legislation has to change for us to be, become more resilient. So it'll be interesting to see what happens you know, to these to these plans going forward with, you know, this community, like my community being so vulnerable and being identified as so vulnerable. I have friends, unfortunately, who are in hotels right now because their basement got flooded. It sucks. It sucks to see them go through that, you know. Um, and so it, it really sucks when you see a community who's, you know, who's not close, close, but a city that you love, that you live in, go through such a tough time. And obviously, like, I'm getting it late you know, um, I've been privileged to be able to live in it's a community where we haven't really seen that much damage from climate change, but we just got exposed. And I think a lot of people do get exposed and it's what we do after that will help. Um, so I'm hoping to have some people on the podcast that'll be more local. But the idea is, yes, this is like, you know, I'm trying to get answers as well, but it's also to show you like you can get answers, you know, and, and it's good to seek answers. It's good to get educated within your own community to do things. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to get involved in government, uh, although it would be helpful, but it's also just as a community member, you should know that you have the right to understand what the plans are, to talk to your city councils, uh, councillors, to talk to your mayor, to talk to sort of, if you have a conservation authority or an organization that's environmental, like even, you know, there's people here like that work for nonprofit organizations who know a lot about this type of stuff and why we're flooding and why, you know, we can be vulnerable and where we can be more resilient in certain areas and what we need to do about it and what, how we can do something about it as a community. So that's sort of what I want to kind of get out uh, today. You know, this has been a really tough couple of weeks for, for my city and uh, it's here in the city of Burlington and it, it really sucks. Um, luckily, you know, knock on wood, we've had minimal damage, um, but, uh, from the storm, but you know, it, 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 we're, we're fine now, but you never know in, in the future. So, you know, this is shows that just cause I do an interview with somebody in the Philippines, like Rocky, who's great and, and doing great work there and making sure that we're resilient in those, in those small island states. 
doesn't mean that back here in, in a in a developed country we're not ex- we're not exposed to vulnerabilities when we hit some of these climate change consequences and and i feel like that's something that we need to build on around the world not only in places like the philippines and beautiful places like that but also here in in my city in in my country in my province and uh and go from there so i'd love to hear if you have any uh you know, ideas of working with counselors, working with local officials, uh, engineers, things like that to get more information. I'd love to hear from you. If you can hit me up on Instagram at how to protect the ocean, I'd love to hear wherever you are in the world. I'd love to hear your experience with trying to get answers and what kind of answers you've been able to get, or even have had struggled to get answers from. I'd love to hear your feelings on that. Hit me up on Instagram, DM me at how to protect the ocean. And of course, if you want to sign up for that newsletter to get more information on what's happening, updates on what I'm doing uh, and updates on the podcast, you can sign up if you just go to speakupforblue.com forward slash newsletter. That's speakupforblue.com forward slash newsletter. Thank you so much for joining me on today's episode of the How to Protect the Ocean podcast. Have a great day. We'll talk to you next time and happy conservation.